Is this thing on? Yes, good. Welcome, everyone. And I'm being directed. This is, I need to stay over here. But if anyone knows me, I can't be constrained. My hair is on fire. I tend to jump around. I promise I will try and be good and stay within the light for my blue, my blue spot. So welcome uh, to the evolution of directory services. Uh, my name is Greg Keller. I am, by title, uh, this is the nerdiest title ever, the chief strategy officer of the company. <clears throat> Said another way, I was the original nerd who helped uh, build and launch this product about five years ago. So it is fresh, yet infinitely scalable technology, um, a life's work thus far, and a highly compressed amount of time. Um, and we're going to go through all of this. But a, a couple of housekeeping notes. What are we going to kind of discuss today? Uh, as you will find, I am, I, I, I'm a history buff. I often say I think I, I'm, I, I see life in black and white oftentimes. So when I have built companies in the past, including JumpCloud, I always have a perspective of what came before it. So that is my vision of black and white. In this case, my vision is in about 20 years ago, in the 90s, as you'll see in some of my experiences growing up in, in the world of IT and computing. So we're going to talk a little bit about the history of directory services. We're going to jump into the product that the team and I built and launched, uh, uh, again, uh, uh, just a couple of years ago. And um, then we're going to show you the goods. I want to show you how this stuff works. It's not voodoo magic. It's brutally hard software engineering on protocols, and I, I challenge you never to do this ever again. It's like chewing a big piece of tin foil, but we did it, right? We virtualized a lot of this stuff, uh, as you'll see. But I have a question, uh, a couple of like sort of housekeeping questions in kind. Who here are by role IT administrators? Any sysadmins or, or uh, in the audience, or do you kind of kind of share that role? How about application developers? Interesting, cool. And finally, DevOps or engineering, SecOps, DevOps, cool. Now the money question: Who here, for parts of their job, travel? Yeah. So I'm going to say something uh, uh, that I've never ever ever been able to say before ever. I have been in th this industry. For 25 years, yes, this is gray hair that is starting to pop out. And I have, in that amount of time, uh, spawned a family, a beautiful wife before that, naturally. And um, I get on airplanes, and they don't know where the hell I go or what the hell I do. I just, I just you know, what company are you working on now, Dad? Let me tell you about it, son. So you all have probably similar experiences where you're getting on airplanes and you're leaving your families. For the first time ever, I have my family here. So this is rad. I can't believe it. So for all of those of you that actually put your suitcase next to your bed and put those feet and just walk out the door and say adios to your families, congratulate yourselves and then go home and congratulate them. Your families are working for you as well. So thank you to my family. All right, let's get into this. History lessons, all right? You see the ominous, ominous picture of windows, all right? So let's talk a little bit about, um, uh, as a backdrop, when we as a team, me and a, three other guys, had a hypothesis of what's life like without Active Directory? And that was like, Jesus. You know, you don't, you don't, you don't look at it. You don't touch it. That or an LDAP server. It's just, it's just Oz behind the curtain, and everything else bows to it. And you plug your things into it. But we had a little different vision. But here is really what we saw, and this is how the the sort of industry unfolded. Now, when I joined the workforce, it was 1993. My first job. Um, was a technical account manager. Uh, I was woefully underqualified for the position, but I somehow talked my way in because I really wanted to get into software out of university. <clears throat> and there was no email. The, we, there was no Windows operating system. It existed ver pre version 3. Um, but in effect, my office in New York City at the time <clears throat> was um, cubicles, 
DOS terminals. There was a, a, a fax machine in every single office and CompuServe. This is how we communicated. And we would all huddle around, you know, the CompuServe thing to actually, frankly, it was like a toy, but you could communicate through this thing. Now, as time evolved, clearly at the top, pay attention to the top time frame because I'm going to be turning the hands of time forward. By 1999, as Microsoft was evolving, they were pulling the most shrewd move, the first indication of what Microsoft was going to do to disrupt the industry. And this is what it was. In the early 90s, you, who, who, like me, anyone here who has gray hair, know that they got their claim to fame by commoditizing an operating system, a GUI-oriented operating system that lived and abstracted DOS and other kinds of computing. At the time, HP, Novell, uh, certainly IBM, they owned enterprise. They were the computing backbone, but it was still very complex for the employee base to actually interface with that. Microsoft's first move was to develop and distribute the operating system that would abstract that complexity. But just like us, Microsoft wasn't satisfied. Why does HP or Novell or IBM get all the real money? The real money was owning the backbone. Fast forward, when NT services were delivered from Microsoft in the, in the late 90s, and then by Windows 2000 and Server 2000, this is really where the instituted version of directory services come into play. This is their first chess piece that they still play to this day, which is brilliant. Parenthetically, everything, you're going to think that we're super competitive with Microsoft. I am pay homage to the tactics and to the vision that they had <coughs> of owning an enterprise. I'm just here to disrupt it. <laughs> what they did in turn was create a homogenous ecosystem where an IT administrator, in effect most of the hands in this audience, could become certified. You will know how to interoperate and build from the ground up a whole business computing backbone by point and click. You subscribe, you get these services, you're going to buy hardware to put Windows Server instituted in your organization and very likely put that stuff into a server closet that physically exists on-prem. The little dotted box that surrounds this, at the time in 99, this was your brick and mortar office. That your domain was defined by the physicality of where you were laying cable and furthermore at the center your directory server was what? Your DNS server. That's actually where you were hosting your domain name that Exchange and other things would slave from, as well as your DHCP, right? Those concepts, do you, do you actually have that on-prem anymore? Likely not, right? But you can see how the ownership of all of that critical computing information lied at the center, right? In the hornet's nest, right? And life is good. You would come in and walk up as an employee or your user base would walk up to their workstation. Now think about that word just for a second. This is a word that is derived from the 1800s where people would walk up to a workstation where there would be a lathe or some other mechanical contraption to work on. And that shit was unmovable, right? And then you would go home with your lunch pail and go back. And the next day you'd walk up to your workstation again. As you see how this evolves, this doesn't exist. My world, when I walked in, was just like that in, in the early part of the 90s. A big, fat monitor with like a degauss button on the side, if you remember that. <laughs> I have no idea what that did. It just made the screen do this. And then underneath your desk was a tower. And that tower had a turbo button on it, if you remember that, too. <laughs> and don't know what that thing did either. Sorry, let me, my screensaver's turning on. So you understand. Now let's start to evolve this thing, right? Let's move forward. 2003, and these are rough estimates, but generally speaking, this is what you're starting to see. 
what you are, I'm giving you a little like teaser here. You're going to start to see the world of an IT, a, a, a Microsoft sysadmin's head start to explode. It's sort of like the proverbial man who used to stand on stage and spin one plate, and they could do that all day. My Microsoft infrastructure, I'm good. And then, oh my God, I've got another plate to spin. And then you'll see this evolve. By 2003, two things really start to happen and really couch in the word mobility, right? You're starting to walk into your office and you'll still have your workstation, but Dell, who remembers Dell, of course, they still exist, but what was Dell's claim to fame? Michael Dell's business model that he created was just-in-time delivery of commoditized hardware. What was on the hardware? Windows operating system, which largely to this day is exactly what they're distributing. But you're watching now the necessity of if this person, an employee, some one of your users walks out of this domain, this building, what do we do? How do we make the domain stretch to wherever that person goes with this mobile thingy, right? Well, VPN services start to pop up like mushrooms, right? Open VPN, Nortel clients, think ways to abstract the physicality of your domain in your closed network to now anywhere where you can plug in a phone line into a modem to actually call back. The problem is you had to pretend through VPN like you're actually on the network. You'll see how that kind of get, gets disrupted again in the future. Blackberry. I was that nerd with the holster. <laughs> and I'm in the airport like whoosh, you know, and I have my had huge veiny thumbs because I was like, bam! And I could, you know, crank out emails all day. But that is an example of yet another piece of infrastructure now, very brittle infrastructure at the time, because I recall my BlackBerry service always falling down. You had to manage another Windows server, install this BlackBerry Exchange server interface that plugged into Exchange so I could syncopate my mail service out to this hip-held device, right? So more hardware. We're, we're moving on. Let me go back a slide and watch this. Forward a slide, right? Now these laptops that were once the pride possession of your field sales force are now being more regularly distributed into your, you know, sort of workforce that lives within the domain. Problem is, 802.1x at the time, or prior iterations of wireless authentication and connectivity, sucked, right? If you remember, you had to be like five feet away from, you know, the, the kind of the WAP in order for this stuff to work. You needed supplicants. Can you even spell that word? that had to live and exist on Windows 7 and 8.1, right? Before, you know, Linux was actually much better than that at the time, but Windows was very problematic with early in, in, uh, iterations of 802.1x. But radius services now needed to be a thing. So you could, you, you as IT administrators were now buying WAPs, putting ladders against the wall and tapping these things in. That's part of your job now and tethering them in, then going back to the server closet to spin up another Windows server or an extension of Active Directory called the Radius role on the Windows server, right? In order to, again, manage more complexity, more environmental things to just get back to the middle, get back to that user identity. So just more infrastructure. Um, yeah, so, you know, that becomes a, a, a big thing. All right. Let me go back a slide. Watch the, watch the change. This is a slide build up. Blackberry, boom, Gmail, all right? I'm living in San Francisco at the time, but roughly 1995. I have a, uh, my work email accounts all managed by Microsoft. I have a Yahoo thing on the internet using my Netscape browser to access. And my friend, we had Google existed, but they're a search engine. This is even predates their prowess as an advertising juggernaut. But by 2005, you know, they're clearly there. They're generating massive revenue. They're the sweetheart of Silicon Valley. And I get an email from my friend on my Yahoo account. It's like, you're invited to Gmail. Like, why the F do these guys want to become an email provider? Microsoft Hotmail is going to kill the universe. Dumb, right? I'm not thinking. Google is 
the, the more shrewd version of Microsoft, even to this day. They're playing the long game. They acquired some technology. They build in a web-based console to access email that is not dissimilar to Yahoo or Hotmail, but it does one other extra special thing. It can connect to Active Directory. You can actually map your domain to this web-based client. And that's like, oh shit, that's cool. Because I don't have to buy an, an exchange license anymore. These things are at like five bucks a pop for a user license. You know, that's nothing in terms of my cost of managing and making exchange redundant across my forest of Active Directories. I'm buying that. But it's one more thing. You actually do need servers to make the connection. GADs. It's not a disease. The, I got the GADs. <laughs> Google Apps Directory Sync, right? It's a thing. It still exists to this day. It is a Google product just to get things to glue together so you can slave Active Directory identities and build user accounts on your now corporate Gmail account, right? So all of that, just more infra, right? It's making Microsoft, the balloon is stretching, right? We move forward. What changed? Go backward. Notice the difference. Go forward. Even, and notice the time period here, we're not, this is like still right around 2005, the desktops, they're gone. Your IT hardware purchaser is not buying towers anymore. They are now on a full enterprise license, likely with Dell or Lenovo, now that is coming online, and you are able to just get these things drop shipped. And they're typically often with your corporate image on them, which is really cool. By 2005, that's like, pfft. that means you as the sysadmin often don't have to have like all the, mat or the Windows laptops across a big table and you got them all plugged in and they're all imaging at the same time. That shit goes away, right? So Dell and other companies are making that more easier. And now everybody is mobile. 802.1x is screaming, Cisco, and you know, prior to that, Meraki um, is, is just developing insanely efficient hardware, commoditized. It's still <coughs> expensive, but it's the best, right? And then, of course, oh, there's Ruckus. And there's just a, now a plethora of these sort of hardware manufacturers um, that are doing this kind of stuff. But it's just easy now. But um, now everyone is mobile. But now there's one other thing. Let me go back. De no, desktops, let me go forward. Now, what's the thing with Gmail? So actually, I made a little mistake. This should be 2007. Um, iPhone 1 comes out. So by this time, I still have a BlackBerry. And I'm like, whoosh. And now I'm, you know, I got to be that nerd who gets the, the device first. And I, I'm building the startup. And we're all on Macs and all this kind of stuff. I'm like, iPhone, this is the future. And I remember in the office showing, it's like a browser in your pocket. But what it's doing is it's giving me even like stuff I could never do on my um, uh, BlackBerry device. When I was at an airport, I would have to you know, struggle to use, the, first of all, the insecure airport Wi-Fi just so I could, I, if I had to do something real other than email, which I could do quickly, I would have to stop, fire up my laptop, do a bunch of, you know, get on the wireless, do a bunch of shit, and then, you know, then put the laptop away and, you know, get on my plane. The iPhone is just like, bam, 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 bam. You know, I could, re I could browse, I could do whatever I needed to do. That was the game changer. And many of you who, you know, here in this audience are challenged with the task of managing that infrastructure now with Android and iOS in many cases. So you see how the disruption is happening. That is an orthogonal move that Microsoft absolutely blew. They should have been in front of that trajectory. They weren't. That's where Apple became a thing. Now, what, now let's talk about Apple as a Trojan horse. And that is one of the examples. So let me, uh, we're, we're going to get there. So check this out. Here's our current slide, about 2007. Notice the difference. All right. Now, let me pause. Who knows what that software sign is? No. OK. Let me tell you a story about that symbol right here. Actually, this dates to 
2000. So I'm a little forward here. I'm really saying that SAS apps by 2008, that's what you're using. Nothing is going on-prem. But the story of that symbol is this. I am a software product geek in, in working on you know, basically database development technology. So super geeky, super fun, but hard work. And we all are in downtown San Francisco. We leave our office. And on one market, which is on the Embarcadero and Market Street, in the middle of downtown San Francisco, beautiful part, um, this company overnight papers the windows on the, the first floor, street level, of this building called One Market. And that symbol is on it. And we're like, what the frick is this? Like, we are, that's pretty ballsy for a company to be doing this in the middle of the software world. <coughs> that is Salesforce. That was Mark Benioff's symbol. That was his first brick and mortar office right across the street from us. And what he was saying to the world is not anti-software, but why would you ever install anything on premise again? Right? That was the, before we could even spell the word cloud, that was it. But you're watching a couple of different major tectonic moves happen in this time period, right? And especially as it relates to like the pressure coming down on Microsoft. To the top, you have a, um, a world of, uh, call them um, services, they're websites that you subscribe to to get you know, services from. It could be a CRM, it could be an expense system. We all use about a billion of these today. But the problem was, it was the first form of shadow IT. Right? I mean, it existed, but does anyone here not know what shadow IT is? Okay, very, the, the 20 second definition, it's stuff that exists outside of the control and security of your IT and SecOps team. So why does that matter for something like Salesforce? Think about this. I'm in a, pretend I am an aggressive sales and marketing leader, and I've got this IT team working in the past with like, every time I need to do something, I've got to get it requisitioned because they have to order software and it's got to, I got to wait. And then I've got to have a server deployed and it's got to get installed on the server. And then they have to issue me licenses and then put identities. What these sales and marketing people did was take a credit card, go into a browser and get the service like that, but with no attachment to corporate security. Right? So you're building one of the main things. I remember our sales VP was like, over my dead body would the CRM go into space. Like, I need to see it. That's where our IP lives, our most precious gem, which is our customer database. Right? What had happened early on was nefarious salespeople would be downloading reports and be like, later, and take them to their next gig. Right? So access control becomes a major thing to this internet problem. New vendors start walking in to create protocols like SAML, which you'll hear a lot about in the, the later half of my presentation. And the same thing is occurring here in the infrastructure world. Why would I, if I go back a slide, I have a, I have a bunch of Windows servers, physical or virtual, in racks, maybe at a colo that I'm managing. Why the hell am I ever going to do that again when I can use an open source variant of a highly efficient server infrastructure. It's got its own version of Active Directory called LD, OpenLDAP, and we can just use that. I don't even need to talk to IT because my job as a DevOps engineer, they didn't even call them DevOps at the time, as an infrastructure engineer, I can just get this stuff spun up, new term in the 90s, and we're on our way. And I'm paying for this on an hourly rate super cheap, and I don't need to deal with those IT sysadmins down, down the hall. So you're seeing all of this, this fracturing, and more vendors have to come in, privileged access managers, and those that can negotiate SSH key transactions. It just becomes that the once purified administrator for a Microsoft domain's head has now exploded, right? This is well outside my MCSC examinations, I, I don't know all the inner workings of Linux. They taught me PowerShell, but what's this bash thing? 
you can see how just the fracturing has happened in the community and still largely exists like this to this day. Now, to the Apple point, all right? Go back a slide, 2000, 2007, iPhones are ripping. You see some Macs. By 2010, Mac is real. Mac is in. It starts with the creatives, oh, math people, oh, who they come in with their shiny white plastic things. If you remember, that's what they looked like back then. And, you know, against my steel black, you know, Dell laptop, which looks official and corporate, you're using a toy, right? That's what those devices were looked upon, but it was the creatives that cr created the momentum for Mac. Why? Because you would never use Adobe Creative Studio on a Windows machine because you couldn't. And think about that time period. As the world blew towards the internet, who was going to make things beautiful for the internet? Creatives. Back when I was building software, you'd have an engineer who was the UI designer. And you remember what Microsoft UIs look like. Button, 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 drop down, button, 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 button. There was no logical thought, right, about how to make user experience, which is now a thing, uh, brilliant and beautiful, but it was the creatives who needed specialized tools and the machines to run that on that were being hired, but over their dead body would they use a Windows machine, mainly because they couldn't. They couldn't do their job. So Mac becomes a thing. Mac also becomes a thing because of you know, the introduction of iPhone. It was just you know, clearly becoming present. Great companies like Jamf saw an opportunity at the time uh, I, I would date this, I can't, they're a little earlier than 2010, or as I put up there, the year 20,010, my bad. <laughs> That's, yeah, we're all cyborgs by, by that time. But um, they saw the opportunity, like, we're going to create a consultancy and we're going to map these amazing devices, which we believe in, to Active Directory and, you know, traditional corporate <laughs> IT environments. Like, that's how all that great ideas begin, right? So they saw an idea. And they did it, and they were, they're helping to define an interaction between corporate IT and the devices that people really wanted to use. So let's go back, just study this, meditate on it, absorb it, smell it. <laughs> and this is really what your life has become, vendor management. You start to think about, all right, if we bring in another piece of software, what do I need? All right, requisition a server. What are the, the memory requirements? Does it have to be redundant? Times that by three or four or N across our forest of domain controllers. You see, these are all amazing vendors who have created arguably, in some cases, like Okta is a, you know, a multi-billion dollar value business. Ping Identity and Centrify, multi-hundred million dollar businesses. You see AirWatch, you know, which is VMware, Cisco, these are big businesses who all are responsible for just creating a play nice in the pen ecosystem for Microsoft, right? Which is still incredibly important. But watch how even all of these vendors in their own respects are saying, We're, we have a vision that is even not, it, Microsoft is, is a thing, but the world is way different now than Microsoft. So I would say all of us have an independent vision, a way that prescribes to an IT administrator, don't get your hand forced in terms of the resources you would like to buy, right? Because of some other core vendor. So think about protocols, think about abstraction, and think about independence. The whole thing, if I break that down, kind of looks like this. Protocols are protocols. I started my presentation by saying, this is the dirty part of the industry. But there's a reason why a very smart group of people get together passionately to create foundational ways for things to integrate and compute. IMAP, SAML, the domain name services, even LDAP or RADIUS. These are unshakable protocols. But you can even see the vendors that have come in that have said, like Microsoft, IMAP, got it. We're going to build this thing called Exchange, put the Microsoft label on it. You're going to need some servers, but we're taking the pain away 
from you know, managing the protocol, like all of these. They're all examples, though, of how the cloud has absolutely torpedoed the way they once thought about the protocol. The same thing applies, and this is, of course, self-serving, but just to, for Jump Cloud, we, uh, I think most of my presentation was showing the power of Microsoft and domain services. The problem is the internet isn't allowing that to be a thing anymore, right? In five years, many of you will move on to your next jobs, and your infrastructure will not look like your last job. There'll be patterns and similarities, but month by month, quarter by quarter, just stuff that you once had and held in your hands is just floated up to the cloud. It's been, as I say, sassified. You know, it doesn't need to exist. You're subscribing to it and plumbing. You're integrating. I would challenge you, as you see, as we get deeper into this, the most progressive organizations, uh, some of which are our customers, some not, but that I have had the honor to speak with and sort of collaborate with, they all have this new role on their team that is in the IT group. They're API integrators. They're hiring these people now. That's what they do. They speak rest, younger. They just, I got this. They're more DevOps, but they may not be charged with the task of, let's say, uptime and availability, but they sure as shit will know how to write rest to plug things together and make that stuff hum, right? So start ideating through those. I would challenge you in your next, uh, you know, for your 2019 hiring plan. Okay. That's my history lesson for today. Now we transition into the world of Jump Cloud, really what we saw. And that's the backdrop. What we saw, how we saw the industry change was why this team got together, high-fived high -fived literally and said, we're doing this. We are going to do a directory in the cloud and make it awesome. But we had a, a little kind of twist on the directory. It's all about what we, I, we used to call the end point, right? So th I, want, I want to just talk about this slide for a second, all right? We look at the world today, like if I go back to all these slides, like to this slide or this slide, right? This is, I, this is theatrical. Like I'm, I'm meaning to make this messy, but it kind of is realistic. This is how I see it. Your security and identity really doesn't end at the computer. It begins there. <laughs> it's the start point. Its end point is an old way of thinking where your tight brick and mortar domain that was managed by Active Directory or other similar on-premise things would end somewhere out in space, right? There is no domain anymore, guys and gals. It is the internet. It's zero trust. It's beyond corp. Things begin, whoopsie, disk full. Your disk is full, not my disk. Here, let me, let me get this guy, boom. So we are, um, in, in a sense, really focused on what the identity experiences is like on the endpoint. And for us, it's Mac, Windows, and Linux. Using that as the genesis and working with our own security mechanisms to control the device, and everything else is everywhere. The identity now is in the cloud, that's us. All your stuff is in the, typically in the cloud, or wherever your machine goes. It's gotta traverse the internet to get back to something. And it may or may not, or should or should not, always need a VPN to get to it, right? Protocols and secure protocols at that can help. So let's move on. This is what we've built. We are a directory as a service. So again, the premise was build a central source of identity for a corporation. We focus on the small to medium enterprise. We have now much larger enterprises using us, but we were very focused on solving the problem for companies that were a few hundred to, let's say, the low thousands of employees. Yeah. I talk a lot, so we ran out of disk space. <laughs> I'm still on time, though. Here we go. We'll get through this quick so we get to the cool, nerdtastic demonstrations, which I love to do. It's sort of like, this is so dumb of me to say, but it's like, you know, Michael Schumacher. It's like, you know, it's like me being him getting back in the Ferrari and just feeling it. Now I have like a lot of product people who get to do this, so I, I rarely get to do this anymore. It's super fun. All right, 
At the center of our cloud-based directory service is the core central identity that you're managing for your organization, which is everything. We are managing the credentials of this user, SSH keys, encrypted passwords. The cool part about our product, nothing is seen in clear text, only from the endpoint where it's then encrypted, tunneled, and then hashed and salted. So everything we do when we emit a password out through our system, it's all hashed variants of that password. So we did that security architecture from day one to ensure that clear text doesn't exist within the system. We also, for uh, organizations, schools, or you know, of course, uh, enterprises that manage an Azure AD or Office 365 infrastructure or a Google infrastructure, in fact, the majority of our customers do both, we're the backing directory for it. So we're the thing provisioning accounts into those. We're managing the passwords for them. We look at those services and think about those are big services, but they're just another resource an employee needs access to. They need access to their Gmail account, or if they're going to sign in to Office 365, even the licenses that you're provisioning to the copies of Office on the desktop, we're managing all those transactions. All the password and authentication goes through us. Again, start point. Systems, by systems I do mean computers and servers, Mac, Windows, and Linux. They're the start point, as you already know, very evangelically of me saying it all begins there. But this is really where a massive part of our IP is. Like many of the other vendors, we utilize a, an agent that lives on the endpoint. It's all cross-compiled. We use a language called Golang in most of our microservices and agent infrastructure. If you don't know what Golang is, it's Google's variant of C. You should get on it. It's an amazing language. Um, and this is how we get our work done. That agent sits as a daemon on the machine. And it's responsible for all of the credential management, user account management, multi-factor authentication, which is a major part of our endpoint coverage. So which we do, you can use Google you know, or Duo for mobile, any you know, sort of multi-factor thing that spits out TOTP keys, you can leverage through our solution. Um, we also, interestingly, you'll, you'll hear us often referred to as an MDM. We're not. I mean, MDMs like Jamf, like VMware and others, those are the folks that you're provisioning and making machines with at this time. But we do policy management across, think of it as GPOs across Mac, Windows, and Linux. So to help harden machines, we do all that kind of stuff. But one of the major aspects is the ability to execute commands across fleets of machines. Here's why. The largest of our customers, in fact, that's, that's, a, that's a mistruth. Uh, uh, the majority of our customers, some who have many thousands of endpoints and employees and some who have just a few hundred, they often aren't even using our UI. They're using REST to just operate the machinery because we have agents across all these machines. So they can download software. They can pull back information from the machines and report. All of this is done through a, a wide-casted uh, automated array of uh, REST endpoints to help you operate your, your Windows, Mac, and Linux instances. That's what that sort of last uh, sort of aspect means. We got really good at this in the early days because a big emphasis of us was ephemeral Linux infrastructure. So you needed an agent that was not only secure, but could hum, get baked into Amazon you know, images or CentOS images or whatever, but it had to spin up find its way through port 443, right, which we do, out to our REST API endpoint through a mutual TLS connection, pick up information, bootstrapping information. What POSIX groups do I need on this machine? Where are the SSH keys? What user groups and user accounts? So we got really good at this at ridiculous scale. Like, like literally, in many cases, a 1,000 Linux um, instances could be spun up Hit, it, hit our REST API endpoints, and we're just doing magic to bootstrap the machines. So now think about that technology across Windows and Linux, or I'm sorry, Mac as well. Ra uh, Radius, a protocol that we've slaved over to basically, again, take that central authority of an identity and their credentials, but now map them out through the wireless networks, VPNs, and other cert-based transactions you may have on your machine. We are, think of us as free radius, but you don't have to manage the radius server infrastructure anymore. It's just all virtualized in the cloud. It's just part of the platform. 
move further, storage. Anyone here use on-premise NAS? And when I say NAS, network attached storage. Synology, QNAP, Samba servers. OK, good. That's a pain in the ass to authenticate. And why? You can defer that box, like the, the, the Synology box, out to an LDAP instance, which is that's cool. But if you're not doing SMB or the Samba-based transactions carefully, you could be in a security pinch. And we do all of this security negotiation behind what is a ancient MD4 hash system, which we've upgraded the security for. It's crazy how old that's, that stuff is, Samba. And file sharing infrastructure was never meant to live in the cloud. It was meant to be in that brick and mortar domain where it's hyper protected and it would just be act, accessed on domain, right? We've made that so it can traverse the internet. So our, our Samba services are really world class in that, in that regard. And finally, application support. We do like the Octos and the One Logins of the world. If you don't have that product, we have a whole array of SAML as well as L, virtualized LDAP. So if you've got on-premise JIRA, Confluence uh, that you need to plug in, or, or infrastructure tools like Jenkins, things of this nature that need a traditional LDAP, you can plug that into our, our public uh, LDAP endpoint. You have an array of SAML-based applications, Salesforce, Expensify, like all that, like Slack. You use our SAML endpoint. Again, it's just about the employee and what around them do they need access to? Does it make sense? Cool. This is just the glory shot in terms of, uh, this is why, again, if you looked at our original business model and hypothesis, this is what we wanted to do. Five years later, not a single line of that business prospectus has changed. Literally, the founding documents that we wrote and crafted, we want it to be cloud-based. No, what is it to have a domain anymore? It's like sort of domainless. You, have a, you buy a domain on VeriSign and you just go from there, right? So how do you protect your now beyond corp or zero trust domain? Make it independent. Make it so an IT administrator never has to say in the back of their mind, shit, if we do this, it's got to work with Microsoft, right? You should never have to ask that question again. Choose what you want to be most productive. And finally, I beat this horse, start point. Just start evangelizing that term. It is not the end point, it is the start point. And you should be thinking about the way you, those devices are secured and traverse the world physically and virtually when you, get, you know, hand them over to your brand new employees or students or faculty. This is just. Uh, we have no real vertical. Everyone who is either retailers or SaaS-based companies or have used us or are using us, right? So we span from, anyone who know, know who Grab is? No, right? Because you're from, the, from EMEA, from the UK and, and the surrounding regions. You know Uber is though, right? Yeah. They're bigger than Uber in Asia, right? They, in fact, bought Uber's business in Asia. They're both SoftBank invested companies. Um, that was an interesting transaction. They are, we are the foundational directory for their 12,600 employees and 14,400 endpoints. They're roughly hiring about 150 employees a month. Very transient. They're, you know, their last round, uh, Series H, was 1.5 billion. It's incredible, but we're the thing that doesn't sit in a closet anymore, but that operates their identity across two business units, all of IT and all of engineering and DevOps. So all of their Linux infrastructure, like the apps that the drivers are using, it's all authenticated through us, right? So because of the Linux sort of play, that's what we do. Anyways, you see a bunch of them. Anyone from France here? No? One person from France. You ever heard of Delph Engine? So all of you own cars, likely. You open up the hood of your car and you look at the engine parts. Anything that is black and plastic <laughs> is made by Delph Engine across the world. The most traditional type of infrastructure you can imagine. They're not very SaaS, right? They've got manufacturing plants in the Philippines and Venezuela and other places. And they use us to remotely distribute authentication to the, actually the physical machines that are still running Windows 7 to actually make the black plastic parts, right? 
So we are, from the cloud, authenticating all these things. Now, in this region, we can only be as effective as we are through great partnerships. So we have two luminary partners, Employee Zero and Data Jar, who are just wonderful to work with. They know they are evangelizing us, and we're so honored for that. But these are the folks that if you ever have the opportunity to work with um, through our partner division, please talk to them. They are absolute experts in really the pains of IT, cloud, moving to the cloud, if that is an objective for any of you. These are folks that you absolutely need to be speaking with. We have learned a metric shed load <laughs> of just the way to think about operating, not only in this region, but about lifting and shifting to the cloud through our conversations with our partners, these key luminary partners. OK. We are exactly 10 minutes. Boom. That's all I'm going to need. And then you're out, and we're eating lunch. All right. So now is where we get to the fun stuff. All right. This is the demonstration of Jump Cloud. And I promise you, I will not bore you. It is like, nor is it parlor tricks. I'm using everything live. So let me just refresh, make sure my token is still there. Um, let me just restart this uh, Mac VM. Cool. I'm going to take off my glasses because now I can't see you, but I can see my machine. This is what happens when you get old. It's going to happen to you too, Seamus. Sorry about the bad eyes. Um, so here's what we're going to do. So I have a couple of products that we're going to use. This is the Jump Cloud Administrative Portal. In fact, this is actually the Jump Cloud Multi-Tenant Portal. So if you have needs to manage many sub-organizations, like you're a partner or a school or whatever, we have all that sort of technology. This is the first resource. Actually, specifically, if I launch into, uh, this is really the administrative dashboard. That's point one or resource one. Resource two, a MacBook. This could be a Windows machine or a Linux endpoint. We're at a Mac conference, so of course I'm going to show the interoperation. Now what's the demo? It's going to, uh, the best way to do this is the most typical operation of, that IT people go through very often weekly, which is onboarding someone. It's like a brand new employee, right? So here's how this is going to go down. I'm actually going to, um, uh, sort of show you the interoperation between uh, our product, that MacBook, and in fact, let's call up another one. Let's do admin.google.com. Whoops, I need to spell. It's hard on this tilted up keyboard. Admin.google.com. Huh? Am I good? Did you act? Oh, Siri, damn you. <laughs> Set policy to turn you off. Jump cloud, go. <laughs> I got to turn that off. All right, so we are going to create an identity. And within uh, just a few mouse clicks, I'm going to broadcast this identity to basically everything that this person needs, including this, this sort of G Suite account. It could be at Azure or Office 365. I'll just use Google in this case. So here we go. All right, I'm going to play two roles. Role one, IT administrator. Role two, I'm going to play pretend I'm actually the employee receiving this machine, right? So we have a couple of ways to do this, uh, bootstrapping or creating an employee. I'm, I'm doing the most basic one, which is just creating one by hand. So I'm going to call this guy um, Charlie. Um, let's do his last name as Keen. How about that? His username, charlie.keen. And we will give him an email of charlie.keen at uh, demojumpcloud.com, which is the domain that I have mapped to that G Suite and my Office 365 account. Oh, you are the best. I would have been like, the demo was supposed to work. But <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Beer's on me. So everything else, like from here, yes, yes, it's, it's recorded. So uh, what I can do is I can bootstrap the account. I can set a temp password, which I will do now. Or I could have had the end user create their own password. I'll actually end up doing that a little bit downstream. Um, let me save this guy. Whoops, they don't match. Let me redo that. OK. 
Okay. All right. Let me go back into my user account. So Keen. All right. I'm active. This is a, a live identity, just like you would build into an Active Directory, but you're seeing through a web-based interface all that kind of good, good stuff. Now to bootstrap him, get him on the stuff he needs, I just add him to some groups, right? So the first thing is we're going to pretend my Charlie Keen character is a new DevOps engineer, and that dude needs a ton of resources, access to servers. We've got to get him a bunch of SAML-based apps. I've got to get him a Jira account. So how do I do that like this? So I've already got a user group called DevOps Prod. All right, I select that particular user group. Now, when Charlie Keen came on board, he had an option. You want a Windows machine, you want a Mac machine, or are you going to use like be one of those guys who needs a Lenovo running Ubuntu, right? I'll take a Mac, right? That's, that's my MacBook over here, right? So that particular MacBook is this guy. So the first question is, how's the Mac? in the Jump Cloud console. It's because I have pre-installed the agent on it. That's why it's there, right? So I will select that guy. In fact, due to Charlie Keene's escalated level of privileges he's going to need on that box, I'm going to make him a pseudo admin. Everything else, I don't even need to touch. I don't need to grant him G Suite, Office 365, or this Jump Cloud LDAP account because my group management is going to take care of that for me. So let's hit go, all right? Now, what just happened? Let's walk through that. So right now, I'm issuing through protocols or APIs. I'm building a Jump Cloud account, of that Charlie Keen account on Office 365, on Google. I'm right now, every 60 seconds, the agent is picking up messages from the Jump Cloud mothership to pull down Charlie Keen's local managed account. That's the one that we're building on there. And behind the scenes, when I added him to that group, Where's my DevOps prod here? I gave him access to all this stuff. A bunch of Amazon uh, IAM infrastructure, Atlassian Cloud, BlueJeans, Datadog, Expensify, GitHub, instantly. He now has access to all these things. Now, instantly in reverse, I can redact all of that. But you can see how quickly we can bootstrap and onboard this person. I also gave him access through our Radius services, both his VPN connection and his wireless office that he belongs in. So it's a way of, we use VLAN and other ways to steer in order to uh, give that uh, uh, unique access to that uh, user to those resources. And uh, if I dip into the computer that I just, again, this virtual machine, if I go into that computer, which is right here, you can see we manage a plethora of info. Everything from, I actually have full disk encryption set on that machine, so we have stored and are escrowing the keys both for Mac and for Windows. I have all of these policies laid down, all of them. You see the red ones are not active yet because the user has to log in and log out to basically bootstrap some of those things. I can see that um, I have one user on the box. That's my Charlie Keen guy, and he's a pseudoer. So I can dip into the machine at any time and start to make modifications. Our agent will allow you to do all that. Let's play the role of Charlie. So the first thing is I'm logged in as an administrative account. You probably have like an admin backdoor account. You may issue one through Jam for other MDMs. Um, this, that's exactly what this is. You can see a bunch of our profiles are now downloaded, so that's cool. But I want to see if Charlie's account is on the box. Boom. So the agent has already picked it up. Brand new. That account wasn't there. And uh, let's go now. I know Charlie is ready to log in. So the experience you're about to see here is really not dramatic. In fact, I, I, should, I, I should set this up with like Jam for our VMware to show an MDM. If you wait to our 215 session, my solution architect, Scott Reed, will be showing how to do a touchless onboarding with Jamf and VMware. Um, but in this case, you're just going to see a normal boot up of Charlie Keene's account. So I didn't do anything extra special for the MDM magic. The password that I'm typing in is his Jump Cloud password, the one that I bootstrapped or I set as the temp account. So let's just log in. And now Jump Cloud is taking over. Right? Jump Cloud is compared the hash. We're good. Now you're going to see the very typical login experience that I know you've seen a million times. This is where your MDM Again, Jamf, Adigy, Fleetsmith, anyone that you're choosing can start to take over. Um, and you would have this customized experience. 
Right now, I'm just using the standard. What, we're, what is, you're witnessing here is the VM is trying to tunnel through to my host, which has a fingerprint system. It doesn't like that, so it's going to fail. So you'll see this. This is why I want to set it up with a sweet MDM demo soon. So let this little guy fail, and then we're going to log in as Charlie. Give it one second. Boom. I don't need you. Now. Welcome to Charlie's new world. Voila. So great. You're like, so what? What just happened? All right. Now, the agent knows all. It is responsible for the authentication, all the security, the multi-factor authentication, which I didn't set up. But if, even to authenticate using you know, Duo or anything to get into this box, we're controlling. But one little anonymous thing happened. It's the injection of this menu bar app. All right, here's Charlie Keen. This is now Jump Clouds. You're going to see this radically expand in the coming weeks and months. This is the presence of identity on the machine. So now, starting with pa simple password change, if I type in my password and type in a password that only I know, which I'm doing here. All right. Right now, I am kickstarting everything. I'm activating all my accounts. From this machine, this MacBook, I have emitted my password change all through every service that you saw in those user groups. All those SAN labs, all the LDAP, all the radius services. The machine is the gateway. The machine now is issuing the secure credentials across the internet securely through mutual TLS. We are negotiating a very secure PKI transaction to our cloud and then out to all the services that we touch. So stay tuned for very exciting sort of announcements in this whole area of our interwovenness, so to speak, with the operating system. So ladies and gentlemen, that is it. Other than our, we've run out of space technical hiccup. I tried to keep you on time, two minutes late. And I hope you have learned a little bit of, uh, about what Jump Cloud is and kind of the hypothesis that we we saw early on in building out this business. Ah, oh, by the way, there's a Jump Cloud policy that just triggered on my virtual machine. It works. <laughs> Thank you. If you have any questions, come and ask. <laughs>